Good morning, my listeners. This is Victor Doctor, and this is another episode of Good Morning BSS World uh, Podcast. And here today, I am going to meet you together with Peter and Matt, who are connecting with me from North America and from Spain. This time, we are going to cover the topic, which is Offshore BPO Confidence Index 2021. Hi, Peter. Hi, Matt. Hey, good to see you, Victor. Hi, Victor. Great to be here. It's very nice to see you. It's very nice to hear you in here. And uh, as I mentioned today, we are going to go through one of the indexes which you have actually created within the last weeks uh, of uh, the year 2021. I will start maybe, Peter, with you. Confidence Index 2021, actually offshore BPO Confidence Index 2021. How did it start? What was the reason to create this kind of index? It's a Victor, it's a really good question. The impetus for this came when I was doing some work earlier on in 2021, and I was working with a lot of different clients that were examining the possibility of entering one or more new offshore or nearshore locations. And as I was conducting the research, I started finding that when you're dealing with country managers, individuals who are operating BPO or contact center operations, in a different location, the sense you get about what's happening on the ground is very different relative to what you might hearing might be hearing from an account manager who works for an outsourcer that's based in Western Europe or North America. It might be different from what you hear from an investment promotion agency. These people are really, to use an expression that I think is being very overused these days, but they're they're very much at the coal face. If you're a country manager, you've got to deal with all the nuances. You've got to deal with all the challenges. You've got to deal with the labor crisis that's going on. You've got to deal with redundancy issues, whether it's power, whether it's telco. And you're going to have a much better idea about the extent to which operating in an offshore or nearshore destination is going to be straightforward versus how challenging it's going to be, how many obstacles it's going to be. So I, I thought to myself, this could be the subject for a really cool piece of research. And one of the things that at Ryan Strategic Advisory we like to do is try and get a good sense out there about what's going on in the marketplace, having a real sense about what's happening on the ground. Prior to the pandemic, myself and the analysts that work with me have prided ourselves on getting out to different destinations to try and see what's happening, meeting agents, meeting country managers, meeting people from the operational side. Obviously, that hasn't been as straightforward, but I, I talked to Matt a little bit about how something like this could be executed and how we could work together because uh, Matt and I are old friends. Matt understands the outsourcing industry exceptionally well. And we thought that we could collaborate to put together a piece of research that would really reflect what was going on from the perspective of the operations in some of the key offshore and nearshore destinations. And really the, the, once we got the idea down, once we formulated the, the concept, executing it was, was pretty straightforward. Thank you very much, Peter. And thanks for mentioning Martin here, because for our listeners, it is worth to mention that this is a report. This is an index which is created in partnership, Ryan Strategic Advisory and Cognitive Copy. And here we have uh, Matt uh, with us. So Matt, uh, what was the beginning of, of, of this index? Yeah, as, as Peter cut very well, it was really just a, a, it was an idea to speak to country managers on the ground and get their perspectives on what it was like to do business in each of these locations, uh, you know, for operating a BPO center, providing customer experience services. Um, and really, we wanted to understand instead of, instead of just listening to what organizations and what government institutions like to tell us, which is usually very positive and for good reason. A lot of these places have a lot of positive elements to them. Um, we wanted to also understand what it was like um, from more of a, a first-hand frontline perspective from people who have to deal with all of the issues of running a business in, the, in these countries on a daily basis. So. Um, we decided to put this out there and we conducted a survey with you know, nearly 100 BPO country managers and executives to find out what it was like to do business in, in each of these nations, which we'll, uh, we'll go into in a minute. But yeah, it was really, I mean, there isn't this kind of research out there really um, 
these kind of honest perspectives. Um, you know, I, I was a journalist previously in the industry, so it was my job really to go into these companies and try to get honest, uh, upfront answers about what it's like to, to run these contact centers in, in certain countries. So for me, this, this research was kind of a no brainer when Peter suggested it and more an extension of the work I was already doing. Thanks for this. I must say that this is really quite big um, uh, index. I am actually a guy who very likes uh, paper, so I have printed that. Yeah, I have it with me. So, uh, well many, done. Uh, yeah, nice. yeah, that's a perfect work which you did. Uh, and uh, Matt, you have already said uh, one number, which is uh, a close to a hundred of respondents uh, of, of the survey. Uh, mm -hmm. Peter, uh, maybe let's focus on those numbers. Can you share with mm -hmm. us some more details? who was actually uh, the group of people who you were targeting to get this information and what kind of information you wanted to get from your respondents? It's a, it's a very relevant question, Victor, and thank you for asking it. So Matt and I had drawn a line in the sand that if we were going to have an organization participate in the Offshore BPO Confidence Index 2021, it needed to be an individual who was going to complete the questionnaire, which I think took most people about 15, 20, 25 minutes to do. Uh, they needed to be people who were actually involved in the operations of a contact center for an outsourcer in an offshore and nearshore destination. So it, it couldn't be filled out by people who were in the headquarters of the outsourcer, perhaps a central headquarters in Western Europe or North America or, or different parts of Asia Pacific. It had to be an individual who was actually conducting operational or managerial type tasks, people who are going to be able to understand the broad nature of doing business in a particular location. And we were quite pleased about the fact that really from the outset, we were able to engage a lot of individuals that were very willing to take part. In fact, I think, Matt, we didn't have anybody who said that they would not take part. Uh, we were quite fortunate that our network is, is relatively robust. We were able to use the connections that Matt had from his time working as a journalist covering outsourcing and some of the connections I've got just from the work I do as an analyst. And what we found was that the responses we got were very candid. Uh, there was no sugarcoating. That was abundantly clear right from the outset. There was also, I think, the willingness to provide commentary. We we had comment boxes all through the questionnaire that people could leave their thoughts around. And we were able to pick up some fascinating anecdotal bits of evidence or qualitative bits of evidence that, that really supplied to us some context that we could put around the numbers. And when the report was written by Matt, I, I think that he did a great job in drawing some of these different elements out. Because numbers can say so much, you can interpret them in so many different ways. But when you've got a little bit of that flavoring, you can truly, I think, draw out some of the frustrations as well as, uh, quite frankly, some of the positive aspects that outsourcers are facing when they're doing business in these different nearshore and offshore destinations. Yeah, I must say that uh, there is a huge uh, scope of uh, information, scope of data, which you have collected. Uh, I am going through the first pages of, of your report, and you've got here focus on political stability, economic stability, public security and safety, infrastructure, commercial real estate, public sector trustworthiness, government support, BPO industry, uh, recruitment and staffing, lots, lots, lots of uh, stories. Uh, Matt, let, let's switch to you. Uh, why this kind of scope of information was in your interest? Uh, did you, after creating the whole uh, index, uh, think that you've missed something or you covered this what you wanted to cover within those uh, within this publication? Well, personally, I felt that the work that we did really covered every element of doing business in, in a country when you're working in the BPO industry, uh, all of these all of these categories, all of these topics are so relevant to anyone who has operations in, in each nation. I think that things like overall national stability, like availability of talent and infrastructure, these are the, the core elements of doing business and, and industry cohesiveness and having a very strong, uh, very collaborative industry made up of several companies, several competitors, um, having government support from very dedicated government bodies, 
uh, industry associations and things like that. You know, when you when you pull this together, when you look at national stability, when you look at the political side, the economic side, public safety, crime, uh, trust in the public sector, that really covers you know the the kind of government and and the national sort of stability side of it, and then. When you look at availability, availability of talent, you've got language skills, the scalability, uh, you know, the, the capability to actually employ lots of people. A lot of contact centers need hundreds of people. It's a very cyclical industry. So, you know, attrition is a big deal. If you can't source more people and bring them into the company, then you've got a problem. And if a company, if a country can't provide talent, then, you know, it's probably not the best choice to set up a center. Um, and likewise, infrastructure, if you don't have good real estate prices, if you don't have solid transportation networks, if you don't have stable internet connectivity and utilities, then how you, you, know, you can't expect to operate a call center or a BPO center within a country. So really, when you put all that together, we the reason we went into so many categories is to try to paint that complete picture of all the considerations that country managers have to make um, on a daily basis and the organizations and other buyers or procurers of BPO services have to think about when, when they're looking for partners uh, around the world. Yeah, I'm so glad that actually you started with this human factor because in fact now after two, nearly two years of uh, pandemic we can organize uh, work nearly everywhere working from home but uh, first of all we need to have people who can work from us and then in the second step we've got this infrastructure elements cost and all of the all of the other stuff. Peter, question to you, because we already mentioned the, the word offshoring, but let's define it uh, mm -hmm. for the purpose of your index. This is offshoring from the perspective of uh, um, of people who are living in US or in Europe or somewhere else. How do you define offshoring in this um, uh, index? So the idea about offshoring here, and, and offshoring would take into account the, the element of nearshoring as well. The idea would be in in terms of what we did, services that would be delivered in a foreign country in an offshore or nearshore destination for a consumer that would be living in Western Europe, North America, Australia, Singapore, New Zealand, Ireland, uh, really any of the key demand markets. Okay, and those countries or those regions which you have mentioned are those uh, which you were asking your respondents to provide you answers? No, we were asking the responses from the offshore and nearshore destinations, the 12 that were enunciated in the report. Okay. But the idea the idea here, Victor, would be that the countries, the 12 countries that are studied in the report, those locations would be where the outsourcers would be situated to deliver work to the key sourcing demand markets. Okay. So now let's go maybe deeper into, into this uh, index. Is there anything what, after analysis of, of those uh, replies, which you got surprised you, or everything was quite easy to, to be predicted? Well, look, I, as an analyst, one of the things I think that we always try and do, and I'm sure Matt will agree with me on this, is you want to be surprised. You want to look for the things that are, are going to perhaps take you a little bit of back or, or a lot of back and, and try and suss out why perhaps uh, the numbers or the responses didn't tie up with what your initial assumptions were. That's part of the fun of this job, number one. But equally speaking, from a commercial standpoint, it's very important to get these types of things out on the table to help your clients and help businesses in general make their decisions. Look, I think for me, one of the things that really stood out was the fact that we've been hearing a lot of anecdotal evidence over the course of the past um, three or four years about the strong operating environment in Colombia and the fact that Colombia is an incredibly straightforward place in which to do offshore work. And I think that if you take a look at the number of organizations that have set up shop in Colombia from an outsourcing and CX perspective, that validates it. But this is the first time I've really seen encapsulated in one document and in one set of responses why Colombia is so strong. And, and I think Matt will validate this and Matt will know Colombia perhaps even better than I, I do, having done a tremendous amount of work in the near shore and having lived there. Um, really, it, it fared strong across most, if not all, categories. And that was very, very important from the perspective of individuals who are operating contact centers or outsourcing facilities in Colombia. There's very much a sense 
that it is a location that you can really trust. That's almost, it's like what they say about uh, nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. Well, I think it's almost like that with Columbia right now. Uh, another fact that, or another factor that I, I think surprised me a little bit was the extent to which uh, we, we saw perhaps not as much enthusiasm for Poland. And and Victor, please don't hate me for saying this. I, I'm very conscious about where, where you are in your base of operations. But truly, I think that um, considering that Poland had made the top five locations in the most recent buyer survey that was conducted by Ryan Strategic Advisory, it was very, very strong in terms of buyer perception. Those operating on the ground found that perhaps it was uh, not coming up uh, as strongly as it maybe could. And that's one of those areas where we're seeing a, perhaps a little bit of a disalignment. So for me, those were, were, were two standouts. There was a lot that stood out, but those are two that come to mind immediately. I'll, I'll let Matt to give his thoughts on those because he'll probably have uh, infinitely more interesting and concise uh, elements than I do. Matt, off you go. Uh, well, you asked if there were any surprises, right? For me, the biggest surprise was seeing that all the country managers in Honduras had the highest confidence in their ability to source agents from multiple languages, which, you know, put Honduras at the top of that category. Um, and which, you know, it surprised me a lot because I've been working uh, with some stakeholders in Egypt recently, and they seem to be completely uh, on top of it in terms of getting languages from you know all different types of languages, from English, French, German, Italian, Spanish, uh, every, almost everything you can think of, and yet respondents in Egypt were had quite low confidence on average uh, in obtaining those kind of languages, uh, particularly from well they were saying that it was low low quality language learning from public education. So you know we're to assume that perhaps private education is doing a better job at putting those those languages out there, but to see, you know, Horan Juris at 87.5% confidence rating, like trumping all the others, and Egypt down at 75.2%, it was, yeah, that was the biggest surprise to me, I think. I must say that I am also following this, what is happening in Egypt from the perspective of the BPO or ITO market. And this is a country which is developing hugely. They, they are surprising positively uh, within the last years, really ma massively. Okay. Uh, Peter, Matt, uh, I can see in your report that there is something like overall uh, rankings which is placed in, in here. And uh, the number one is Colombia, which is which was already mentioned by you, Peter. Then we've got mm -hmm. India, Bulgaria, South Africa, El Salvador, Mexico, Egypt, Jamaica, Philippines and Honduras. How actually this ranking was um, uh, created? So if you could just share what uh, put you the most attention to, 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 to make this ranking as it is, because I guess that there were some answers because of those criteria, this methodology which you have taken, which allowed you to put those countries into certain order. So uh, if maybe we could just spend a few minutes on that. And uh, Peter, how would you reply to that? Well, look, when you're doing this type of a, an index, and I think, Victor, you enunciated this a little bit earlier, you know, you've got to have as broad a number of categories as you possibly can. And, and Matt was, I, I think, very, very clear in terms of the fact that we wanted to get as much of a global view of what it's like to operate in a different location as possible. So when you consider those uh, 11 or 12 categories that we put together, each category had a series of subcategories or sub-subjects that we were asking the individuals that were undertaking the study to rank on, on a scale of one to four with uh, one being not good and four being very good. And, you know, when you consider the fact that we're looking at different aspects of labor, different aspects of infrastructure, commercial real estate, we're looking at political stability, economic stability, public security and safety, among others as, as broad categories. Um, we got fairly into the weeds in terms of what some of the different elements that they would need to be looking at and what we would need to be able to tally up at the end of the day in order to get a sense about how well things were going or about the areas that perhaps they were facing some challenges. And, you know, I, I think one of the things that Matt and I got very good at as we worked through the results was we learned a lot about Excel 
we learned a lot about um, the, the, the best way to make sure that we organize data in such a fashion that it's comprehensive, but equally easy to interpret and easy to read. And, you know, as I say, one of the important things with this study was the fact that we did get into the weeds. We did get as granular as we possibly could, because one of the things that I've learned working as an analyst for nearly 20 years, and I still can't believe when I say that it's almost been two decades, but the, the, the best research, the best analysis is going to be the research that gets to be as specific as possible. And we didn't hesitate to ask questions that were of a granular nature to make sure that we could get the best possible idea about what was going on in each one of these markets. And I think given the fact that we were that we were getting the participation that we did, there was an appreciation amongst the respondents, the people that participated in terms of the types of questions we were asking, because I think we were we were hitting the, the chords that we needed to hit. And when you consider the feedback that we've been getting on the report and the number of downloads that we've been getting, uh, it seems that that's a view that's uh, shared pretty universally so far. Okay, thank you for this. Matt, uh, maybe a question uh, for you, because those countries which are mentioned within this uh, uh, index, they are from Americas, from Africa, from Europe, from Asia. Did you notice any significant differences between the regions as such, because the countries are located somewhere in, in, in the world? Uh, is there anything uh, what uh, put your attention, like this is something what is important for a certain region? I mean, it's it's a little bit difficult to compare all the regions. Um, yeah, I assume so. Because, yeah, because they each have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, but when you look at regions individually, you can see it's easy to kind of look at it that way. So, I mean, let's take Latin America, for example. Most respondents in Latin America, they, they have this high confidence that they're able to source talent. Um, they're quite confident in the presence of government support and in BPO sectors in general. There's a good uh, collaborative environment in, in most Latin American nations. Um, however, while infrastructure is fairly robust in, in the larger countries like Mexico, Colombia, and even El Salvador, apparently, you know, they're, they're saying that they're very confident in El Salvador, that their internet is very, very strong and that their telecoms are very secure and strong. Um, there's still room for improvement in countries like Honduras and Nicaragua, where, you know, they're sitting quite low in the rankings, uh, particularly for infrastructure. Um, but then you have to look at it from another perspective in that scalability in Latin America is, is not quite as strong as it would be in Asia. Um, countries like the Philippines and, in, and India, they've been providing BPO services for many decades. There's much higher populations in these countries. That, that, huge nations with a lot of experienced talent. Um, so scalability is always going to be a problem in Latin America as these countries are still growing into the industry and evolving. Um, so there's, I mean, there's a real opportunity for Latin American countries to offer more niche services of, of higher value services that not just, um, you know, these just basic telephone calls and things like that, but, you know, looking more technical, uh, technical support and things like that. I think it's, uh, there's there's more value there for Latin America. Yeah, th th this is, I guess, similar, uh, Peter, like it was with uh, South Africa some time ago. Yeah? yeah, A few years ago, we were considering that South Africa is just for voice services and then it has boomed and developed to a uh, wider scope of the services which are being provided from that location. Okay, you mentioned India, Philippines, you mentioned also some countries from uh, South Africa. Uh, maybe let's uh, jump into Europe for uh, for a sec. Mm -hmm. What are the strongest and the weakest um, things which you have taken away from, from your uh, research when it comes to European destinations? You know, I, I think there's a couple of things. And, you know, Victor, you posed a, a very good question about what we were seeing region by region. One of the things that strikes me, and, and this certainly applies to Europe, is that you get destinations that could be perhaps on the lower end of the index and ones that are very much on the higher. As we were saying, Poland um, perhaps didn't fare as well as, as uh, many would have hoped. And, and certainly we're, we've got uh, hopes for next year. But Bulgaria was the second rated highest uh, location in the index. And something that, that jumped out at me, and this relates to a lot of the work I've done on Bulgaria recently for just some 
work I've been doing with clients is that there's, a, I, I think, a fair amount of faith in the ability to manage the economy. It's a very safe place in which to travel. And that's becoming a much bigger thing for outsourcing executives. Personal safety is something that they're putting a priority on. Uh, equally speaking, you know, the, the, the quality of language skills that you can find in a location like Bulgaria really stand out. Uh, you know, you flip this around in, in Poland, I think that there was some concern uh, that we saw in, in regards to not necessarily the, the quality of the infrastructure and so forth, but certainly the, the stability around the, the political situation and what's happening there was, was very much a standout. We've been hearing this anecdotally as well in other work that we've been doing too. Uh, nobody doubts the great uh, the, the great work that outsourcers are able to do for clients in Poland. But there there were some standout elements that perhaps were a little bit more challenging from that context within Europe. And as I say, we have every confidence, uh, no pun intended, that things will improve and, and that Poland will move its way up the rankings in 2022. Oh, that's, uh, that's a good point, actually, because uh, this is over the, um, another time when I hear this kind of comments that having in mind that Poland has over 25 years experience now in growing the, the BPOs as, as such, now we are in the phase where there are some concerns, I would say. Uh, but, but, but you know, Victor, if I can, if I can just say something there, I mean, look, at the end of the day, and you know, the, the index is, is very clear that, you know, if you take a look at the difference in overall rankings and scores between, say, where Poland sits and Bulgaria, you know, in, in terms of the percentages, uh, Bulgaria had an 86.5% ranking in the confidence index. So, you know, very, very good. Um, Poland was sitting at, at roughly 80%. And there's not a huge amount of difference. I, I think that if, you know, we can take a look at what some of the elements are in regards to where Poland needs to perhaps move forward, some of the macro level elements that they move in the right direction, and if the industry can gain a little bit more cohesiveness as it stands in regards to promoting itself to the rest of the world, there's no reason why we can't see Poland improve in the overall level of where it needs to be. And, you know, I, I'll give another example. South Africa, you referenced earlier, did exceptionally well in a whole lot of areas and I think proved itself in, in many, many different manners of why there's a, been such a huge amount of investment going into that country. But flip it around, you know, perhaps what kept it out of the top three, there was tremendous concern about the viability of South Africa's uh, electricity supply, uh, blackouts or ro what they, rolling blackouts, or as they call it, load shedding is very common. It's become just a way of life. Outsourcers don't like that. And I don't blame them. There's no reason for this type of load shedding to happen. You know, the mismanagement of the power system or concerns about how it's being managed over the long term are very relevant for the CX and the BPO community. Equally speaking, I think, Matt, it was very clear in South Africa that there was concern about the extent to which the politicization of public services is a problem. And, you know, there's no question that the government at, at all levels has done a very good job supporting the industry, but when you get uh, government or public services that are perceived to be uh, over-politicized, that's going to be a problem in terms of the perception of the outsourcers that are on the ground. And this came through in the work that we did. If they can make improvements on the power supply and they can make improvements in overall levels of transparency and confidence in the public sector, there's no reason why South Africa couldn't achieve a top three or even a number one status in 2022. 80% for Poland, it's quite satisfying, I would say, number. It's it's a good base to work from. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think Matt will agree, this is a baseline. This has not been done before. This is a baseline in terms of where things are sitting going into 2022. And I, I think there's a lot of lessons that can be taken away by organizations and by governments and investment promotion agencies in many of these locations. And that's what we're hoping for. We, we want this to be an educative tool. We want this to be something that that countries, whether uh, the stakeholders in different countries look at, and they're saying, well, you know, here's some, some great things that we're doing. Here's what we're doing well. But more importantly, here's perhaps some things we might want to look at doing differently. Okay. 
I must say it, it is a big pleasure actually to go through this index. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before we even started to record uh, our conversation that there are not too many this kind of indexes prepared worldwide. So it is good that something like that is being now prepared and available free of charge. This is important that you are allowing people to download it free of charge from your uh, pages. So maybe let's uh, jump to the end of our uh, talk. And I have one last question for both of you. Uh, and actually, this question is going to be the same, but I will start with Matt. Can you give me the reason why people should download this report? Well, anyone who wants some interesting insights into, you know, doing business on a global scale, you know, that's it's going to be, it's for them. Plus, it's free. What is there to complain about here? Come on. There's no, there's so no reason not to download it. That's so obvious. Yeah, you already mentioned that there were all, uh, over a couple of hundreds of downloads after the release of your uh, of your uh, index. Peter, the same question to you. Why people should download this report? Well, I mean, one of the prime reasons is they'll be exposed to the tremendous literary and writing skills of Mr. Kendall, who uh, is uh, one of the best in the business. And I, I uh, was just so delighted uh, as Matt wrote the report to be able to, to read um, to, to read the prose and, and the context he was able to give it, it was just magnificent. Now, but, you know, all joking aside, it's a very easy report to, to, to go through. One of our, uh, one of our friends at Nearsol posted something on LinkedIn saying, not only is it informative, but it's very easy to absorb. And that's what we want. We, we want people to be able to take this information away, to be able to absorb it quickly, to understand what the numbers are saying, to understand the context of what the data is, is pulling through and be able to apply those lessons in a real world manageable way to their own operations and what they're doing country by country. We want stakeholders perhaps in the investment promotion side or on the policy making side to be able to take a look at this and talk about what they might need to amend in order to make their location one that's going to have an even higher rating in the index as it moves forward. And, and Victor, I can say we're already thinking about 2022. We've had such great feedback since we released the report about a week ago that there's no question in our mind that this is something that's going to be a living piece of research and it's going to be ongoing. And I, I think Matt and I uh, are both very, very pumped to start thinking about how we're going to organize the next one in such a way that it's going to meet and exceed the standard that we set for this year. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and for preparing this uh, offshore BPO confidence index 2021. This is absolutely a very valuable publication and I will make sure to add the link to this index uh, connected to this podcast. So our listeners, our viewers will be able to download it and get the most what is uh, good from uh, from this publication. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Kendall and Peter Ryan were my guests in Good Morning BSS World. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thanks, Victor. Thanks, uh, pleasure to be here.